Welcome to the mostly comprehensive online video tour of your local poet plant. Hard hats are not mandatory on the mostly comprehensive tour, but they do look pretty good, so maybe you want to put one on. It's up to you. The process begins with local producers, who sell us literally tons of their field corn. Not the kind we eat, though. Each truckload helps displace 66 barrels of imported oil. We send all the corn through a hammer mill, which grinds it into a fine powder called flour. Next, we mix the flour with water, special enzymes, and yeast to make a mash and then ferment it. That fermented mash is called <laughs> beer. Not the drinkable kind, though. Sorry. The liquids are distilled, processed, and dehydrated into alcohol, also known as the ethanol. 200 proof and 100% homegrown and renewable. Ethanol's high octane rating of 113 increases horsepower. It combusts at a lower temperature, which helps engines stay cooler. And it fuels everything from race cars to monster trucks to trick airplanes. The stuff is so American, you might as well be filling your tank with baseball or hot dish or apple pie. But back to the tour. The oil is extracted from what's left, and the protein and nutrients are condensed and dried to produce a high-protein animal feed and renewable, there's that word again, industrial product. In addition to three gallons of ethanol, every bushel of corn yields 18 pounds of distiller's grain. So we fuel cars and we help feed a lot of animals, which feeds a lot of people. So by the time our tour ends at the fuel pump or the feed lot, there's pretty much nothing left to waste, which is pretty much the way we like it. And this concludes our mostly comprehensive tour. Thanks for stopping by. Good morning. Happy Teach Ag Day 2016. We are excited to have everyone joining us this morning for Biofuels 101. We hope that those of you back in the classroom are ready to take some great notes and learn a little bit more about the biofuels and ethanol industry within agriculture. Uh, we hope you enjoyed that quick little video to help introduce our topic of talking about biofuels. That video is brought to you this morning by Poet, who we are sitting uh, in their corporate headquarters here in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. So we were Happy to share, share that video with you to kind of kick things off this morning. My name is Ashley Collins. I am the Education and Marketing Manager with AgCareers.com, and I'll be serving as today's moderator for our conversation to learn a little bit more uh, about this industry and uh, where, where it, what's going on in the biofuels industry uh, within agriculture. We are pleased to be joined by these two esteemed panelists who are joining us this morning. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more about each of them. Um, we have with us Doug Bourbon with, he is here, he works here with Poet. Uh, he is the VP of Corporate Affairs with Poet, and he's been with Poet for 13 years now and held various roles within the company uh, as in that time frame that he's been with Poet. Uh, currently, he sits on various boards and then manages strategic relationships, not only at the regional, but also the state and the national level. Um, and he is also considered as a, an authority to talking about ethanol and renewable energy and agriculture, so we're very pleased to have Doug with us this morning. We also have Kelly Manning uh, sitting on our panel. Kelly is the VP of Development with Growth Energy. Uh, Growth Energy is our host for Teach Ag Day uh, and kind of brought us here to the Poet location. Uh, they represent producers and supporters of the ethanol industry, which includes a variety of different companies, one of those being Poet, but then also companies like Western Plains Energy and a good deal others. Uh, Kelly, in that role, he works very closely to recruit and retain those ethanol plants uh, into working with Growth Energy as Growth Energy represents the ethanol industry in a lobbying fashion to support the industry. Um, and he also, I have to throw this in, being a Southerner myself and a true race fan, uh, Kelly, one of the other facets of his job is that he manages the American Ethanol NASCAR program, um, which if you are a NASCAR fan, you're familiar with the, the changeover to uh, ethanol fuel in the NASCAR industry. And so maybe he's uh, slipping some, some sludge or something into Kyle Busch's car. That would make me quite happy. Little plug there. Give the good gas to, to Junior or something. So, but anyway, so I'm going to actually start off with a kickoff question that I'd like both of our panelists to answer uh, as we begin talking about this this morning. And then um, we're going to ask them a couple questions, and then we're going to take time to, to take questions from our audience, both on the web, uh, joining us from all over the country, and then here in the room today. But my first question for both panelists is, if you could speak to what do you think the biggest misconception is about the biofuels industry by the general public? Um, wh what do you think, where do, where do we stand? Um, what do people think right now? Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what people think. 
the biggest misconception that we run into uh, regarding ethanol is that it's been a failure. I, would you agree? I think most people agree with this. If they, they would say because they've read some of the rhetoric and some of the items out there that ethanol has been really a failure. When that's so far from the truth, we are 10% of the nation's fuel supply. We supply half a million jobs to this country. We're a boost to agriculture all across the country. All of the items that, that are great, and we're, we're cr creating energy, renewable energy, and it's been a success. It is one of the biggest untold success stories of the last 10 years, and that's what ethanol is and biofuels. So uh, we're excited to have a better opportunity to explain that to folks around the country. And uh, I'll turn over and ask, I mean, Doug, what he, he feels might be some of that as well. That's well said. I can only add to that that ethanol is important to the economy, national security, the environment, um, and that is a true threat to the status quo of the fuel world today. Uh, as Kelly said, we provide 10 percent of the fuel supply today. We're going to 30 to 40 percent of the fuel supply. Now, the oil company does not want to lose that kind of market share because with that goes profits, goes power, goes all kinds of things. And so it's very frustrating sometimes that we have to fight back on little lies and myths that come up in, the in our industry because there are very few people that know agriculture well or know fuels well or know engines well. And so our detractors cast doubt in the consumer's mind, and we've got to go out and fight back. So we have the facts on our side. They have the money on their side. Uh, but I hope everybody in this room and in this webcast uh, really takes note. If, if there's anything negative said about ethanol, question it very hard because there really isn't anything negative that I can think of uh, that's attached to ethanol. Those are great answers and, and, I mean, wonderfully sets up the reasoning for having uh, today's webcast and this conversation and dialogue and, and taking that out into the classroom uh, to help students understand that. So uh, hopefully that will change uh, and, and you're taking some great notes on what exactly uh, are those misconceptions and how you can maybe change those. So my next question I'm going to ask to you, Kelly, and we've used the term already this morning, both the term ethanol and biofuel. So is there a difference? What is the difference between those two products? Well, there really isn't a difference. Uh, ethanol is a biofuel. So uh, and it w as we have research out there, all this research is saying today, like, you need to call it biofuels and not ethanol because there's a negative connotation to ethanol. But really, we're a bio ethanol is a biofuel. So is biodiesel. So is cellulosic ethanol. So is our, our advanced biofuels and all the other technologies that are going to be out there. I'll go over here to this table. I'll give you an I idea of of how the process kind of works. Uh, you know, for those of you that haven't been to an ethanol plant, this is, uh, we don't use candy corn, but I saw a big bowl of it when I left the house this morning because Halloween is around the corner. Uh, we use number two yellow corn, and uh, that the farmer produces that. They sell that grain, bring that grain to the ethanol plant. There's over 200 biorefineries in this country, uh, many of them located in the Corn Belt, but there are many other states that also are home to an ethanol plant in this country. The product is sold into every state and sold globally. There's a big global market taking place in ethanol today. From that corn, all we do is take the starch to produce ethanol. This is pure ethanol here, and throughout the process, that's what we produce. There's 15 billion gallons of this stuff produced in our country today. We take the protein and micronutrients and produce a high-protein feed called distiller's grain. Now, our plants have different methods and where they sell their distiller's grains to. Many of it goes to the beef market and pork market, mu but much to poultry. They're going to aquaculture. This stuff's being shipped globally. So uh, some, plant, some of our plants dry this and ship it, but many of them sell it as wet cake, and they sell it directly to their markets, their uh, uh, the livestock markets that are in their region. Another byproduct, corn oil. The majority of the, the, the corn oil byproduct is going into the biodiesel market today. But th eventually this will be produced as a food grade corn oil as well as produced into other markets, uh, perfumes and, and, and bio bioplastics and all sorts of different markets we have here. This last item here is uh, 
is uh, called corn stover. So it's the, the what's left on the field after the, the you go through and harvest. It's the stock, it's the cobs, it's the materials that are there. Uh, today, uh, th this organization, Poet and others are out there producing what's called cellulosic ethanol. So cellulosic ethanol uses the waste product and that will be produced and bolted on to some of our corn ethanol plants. The other great thing about this product is it'll power the first plant. So the, 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 the emissions are, are next to nothing, if not below. I mean, this is a fantastic, uh, you know, very science-based part of our industry, uh, cellulosic ethanol. So hopefully I didn't go too far, but I tried to kind of give a better example of what biofuels and ethanol is. Actually, ethanol is a biofuel. And just, can I just add to that one little point? Uh, Kelly mentioned 15 billion gallons of ethanol produced annually in this country. Our company, Poet, with our 28 plants, we produce four and a half million tons of feed. Four and a half million tons, that's nine billion pounds. Just to give you an idea uh, of how much feed we're actually putting out there in this country and throughout the world. A lot of different products coming out of just one process of creating. So that's very interesting. Thank you, Kelly. That's a great explanation. My next question is for you, Doug. You know, we've talked about biofuels. So let's talk more specifically kind of to the agricultural industry. Why are the why is the usage of biofuels so important in the agricultural industry? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, um, I like to put it into three main buckets. Let's call it the economy, the environment, and national security. From a national security standpoint, we reduce the amount of oil that we are dependent upon from OPEC, okay? Um, as you know, there's all kinds of conflicts around the world. The vast majority of them are in oil-producing states. We spend billions and billions of dollars a year protecting our access to that oil. Humanity really has two staples. It's food and energy. And when OPEC nations, the Middle East, is the low-cost producer of oil in the world, we have to have access to that. That creates a lot of conflict. We need a new option, and ethanol is the answer to that. From an environmental standpoint, everybody knows that ethanol burns much cleaner, okay? We burn anywhere from 34 to 60 percent cleaner than gasoline, uh, and that's including growing the corn, harvesting the corn, transporting the corn, the ethanol production process and burning it through an engine. That's a total life cycle emissions, and we only get better all the time while oil is getting dirtier all the time, okay? So there's a widespread. And there's also a very large growing body of evidence that not just from an environmental standpoint, but from a human health standpoint, ethanol replaces the most toxic and expensive chemicals in the fuel supply, okay? We replace carcinogens. We have linked aromatics, which we replace, to cancer, autism, asthma, brain disorder, premature birth rates, all kinds of health problems. So from an environmental standpoint, ethanol is a complete win. From an e economic standpoint, um, we provide half a million jobs here. Um, we pay a lot in taxes. We get no subsidies whatsoever. There are no subsidies, and we reduce the subsidies necessary for agriculture today. We have soaked up surplus grain in this country and created a critical market for agriculture so that our subsidy program doesn't need to be as robust as it was in the past. The, uh, the last part on the economy piece is we lower the price of gas at the pump dramatically. We are a high-octane, low-cost fuel. Because we're so high-octane, the oil companies can buy ethanol rather than producing a high octane chemical to go into the fuel supply. So they can buy ethanol today for about $1.50. It may cost $3.50 to make a competitive molecule. So we reduce the price of gasoline at the pump always, all the time. So those are the three main buckets, and we can get a lot more detailed, but national security, the economy, and the environment course were uh, important to agriculture, but those are really the big bucket items that everybody needs to realize, and that's why, frankly, we're such a threat. Sometimes people don't like really good products in the market because the not-so-good products are going to naturally fade away. And, you know, very timely conversation that we're having, especially uh, I'm actually from North Carolina where 
we've been in a fuel shortage. And so you talk about how dependent we are, I think, uh, in, in the South right now because of um, the unfortunate uh, damage that was done to the, to the oil pipeline uh, and not having access to more ethanol. I mean, gas stations were completely out. You had to, I mean, in some places were rationing. So it's very timely as just me, myself, as the moderator of today's conversation has seen the effects of our dependence upon that. So uh, thank you so much for that answer, Doug. Kelly, and kind of leaning into that, the question about being at the gas pump, if you could explain what exactly E15 that we see on the gas pumps is, and is it safe for our vehicles and for small engines? You know, we talked about earlier, uh, if people say something negative about biofuels, really listen and, you know, really research what they're saying. And, you know, I think a lot of people seeing that at the fuel pump, it's something new, maybe something they're not familiar with. So can you explain what that is and is it safe for our vehicles? That's a great question, and this is uh, an important uh, uh, important item that's taking place right now in our industry, and it's happening at the pump. Uh, E15 is 15% ethanol and 85% gasoline. There's a lot of confusion out there because some people remember, as, as you know, E85 has been around. E85 is, frankly, E85 is 60% to 85% ethanol and the balance of gasoline is what that uh, you're purchasing at the pump. So there's a, the, the C store landscape, there's 160,000 retail locations selling fuel today. So when we launched E85 probably 15 some years ago, today there's only about 2,000 of those 150,000 stations selling E85. So the vehicle manufacturers were producing flexio vehicles to kind of reach the capture that E85 and capture that savings, but there weren't enough pumps out there. So there was this big chicken and egg thing going on. So what's happened is our, as an industry, we pulled back and 97% of the gallons that are sold today have 10% ethanol in them. Nine out of 10 people don't know there's any ethanol uh, according to our research. So they don't even know they're probably putting 10% in their cars already. So the 21st century vehicles, they're going to run on, on higher blends. They can optimize whatever fuel is being offered there. And the first fuel being offered as an alternative is 15% ethanol. So by the end of next year, we'll have over 1,000 stations. Many large C-Store groups are taking advantage of this because they know the health benefits, they know the economic benefits to their consumers, and they know they can provide more octane with an E15 than you can even with an E15. 10. So 10% 10 ethanol moving to E15. So retailers like Sheets, retailers like Come and Go in the Midwest, retailers like Thornton's around Kentucky and Indiana and Chicago, large retailers, racetracks of the southeast and, and the south southern states, they're going to start offering E15, higher blends of ethanol, significantly better for the air, significantly better for the folks purchasing it because it's saving you at the pump, as Doug mentioned. Uh, this is a great thing, and then at the end, that pulls through it pulls through the ag sector as well. So all those all this product we're developing and this additional product is a is a shot in the arm to the ag industry as well, and all those companies supporting that. I can all, I, I I love to add one part to that, and um, this gets to the argument: is it safe for the safe for your vehicle and that, those types of things. E10 is the fuel of the land today. As Kelly said, 10% ethanol is in almost every gallon of gasoline. It's the one constant in a gallon of gasoline. So when you buy gasoline, gasoline is consists of hundreds of chemicals. And those chemicals vary on region, on season, on economics, on all kinds of things. For example, toluene is a chemical that we directly replace. You can trace toluene from... 10% to over 40% of a gallon of gasoline. And we're talking about, is it safe to go from E10 to E15? That's a 5% difference when all of the other chemicals in the fuel supply vary greatly. So if a mechanic ever tells you that ethanol caused a problem, ask them, how do you know it's the ethanol? And they're going to shake their head and they're going to go, I guess I don't. Maybe it was one of those other chemicals. Anyway, um, that's one way that we are viewed we are scapegoated because people don't understand fuels. It's not the ethanol that is the issue. We are the one constant in the fuel supply. People need to understand that. I 
that's great. I, I already feel like a more educated consumer, and, and now I'm excited to continue to put $2.18 gas in my automobile because I'm supporting the agricultural industry while I'm doing it. So uh, thank you for that. So now we want to take questions from you guys, from our audience. And for those of you on our live telecast, want to remind you that you can send in your questions using the hashtag biofuels101, and we have staff here ready to capture those questions. Um, anyone in our live audience here have a question for our panelists? Yes, right here. So our question was, wh wh what is the biggest opportunity in the ethanol energy? Uh, is it different types of using uh, different products to create biofuels? And so Kelly and Doug, I'll let you guys speak to that. Sure, good question. Um, there is expansion opportunity in basically every sector. Most people are talking about cellulosic ethanol because cellulose is the world's most abundant compound other than water. And a lot of the cellulose is looked at as a waste, a renewable waste product. And if we can create energy out of a waste product, that makes perfect sense, right? So we have, we have a cellulosic facility that we opened up a couple years ago, um, and we're making ethanol out of uh, corn stover there. And that is co-located with a grain-based facility. So basically the same farmers can bring in corn and corn stover. Tremendous opportunity all throughout the Midwest to grow that, um, that biomass. In the Northeast, I was just up in Maine, they have a huge paper and pulp industry, lots of trees. We can make ethanol out of the paper and pulp. Um, in the South, they grow more switchgrass. We can make ethanol out of switchgrass down there. So every region is going to have probably a different type of biomass and that'll be very helpful because then we become not a corn state in issue, we become a 50 state solution. And once all the other states start making ethanol out of different biomasses, um, we're not gonna, it's gonna be much easier to fight back against all of the myths in the industry because they're gonna see the, see the benefits, the economic benefits right within their state. But as you know, grain yields are taking off. They are continuing to grow even faster and faster. And so we need to be able to soak up that surplus grain in order to keep prices of grain strong enough so that the American farmer can make a profit. If the American farmer can't make a profit in agriculture, how can the rest of the world afford to farm, right? We need to strengthen grain prices. We've overproduced grains for so long. So I think there's opportunity in grain as well as cellulosic. Um, and other opportunities in diversifying the product stream as Kelly showed you over here. We are today where the oil industry was 150 years ago in product development. We can make this anything out of a grain of corn that you can make out of a barrel of oil. It's just a matter of chemistry and economics and that's where we're going. Yeah, lots of opportunity, absolutely. Yeah, that's a great question. And um, a lot of, you know, coming from a career minded, I sit here and listen at that and I think of all the different careers that could exist and discovering, you know, there's everything from the producer to the research scientist who's figuring that out to the person actually doing the actual producing of the ethanol. So lots of opportunity. Yes, we have a question right here up front. So the question was, um, I like repeating the question so you guys out there on the web can hear these, uh, around the wet cake product that Kelly showed for us uh, earlier and around what type of research is being done on the nutritional value of that wet cake product. Yeah, I, I would just say that um, if you're interested in knowing what research has gone on out there, you can go to Poet Nutrition, our website, and you can look at, if you go to poet.com, there'll be a nutrition link there. And I think we've got all kinds of studies. I mean, there is a large body, the large library of information on the studies that we've done. When we started, you know, 20 years ago, we basically sold our, our distiller's grains to cattle. Cattle can eat anything. And they're, they're a volume-based uh, livestock. Now we sell a lot to the chicken industry. Um, the poultry industry, a chicken might live 41 days. And so their diet is extremely specific. They have to have very specific nutrients. And so we've got a ton of um, data on our distiller's grains for all of the different livestock uh, animals. 
Yeah, I would, to that end, I'd say the research came from the demand pull. And the demand pull started happening in different sectors, not just beef cattle, dairy cattle, and what, what that dairy cattle and what that ration's gonna be, and all the way across the board. So uh, we've tried to work real hard with that because uh, this is an important feed product for all those producers. Right, and depending on what the livestock producer wants, we can produce high protein, low protein, high fiber, low fiber, high oil, fat. We can vary the product significantly. Um, before we take another question, just a quick little technical note here. Um, I believe those of you who are listening and watching us on computers may be having a slight difficulty with your sound and our volume. We are working on that technical issue. If you are watching via a mobile device or have access to a mobile device, uh, the sound there is much better. So uh, if you're able to switch over to an iPad, tablet, phone, what whatnot, um, you may be able to hear us a little bit better, but we are working on that issue for those of you uh, watching via a computer screen this morning. So I think I had another question here in the audience. Yes, ma'am. So the question was was for Kelly um, in his position with Growth Energy around the fact that, uh, as many of us know, those politicians that Kelly works with on a day-to-day -day basis may be very removed from the agricultural industry or from the farming sector of agriculture and understanding the producing side of our business. And so how does he kind of explain and help them to better understand the industry and the impact of the industry? I think that's a great question and very important for all the students out there and others to learn how to, to create the right platform for your advocacy and how strong your voice will be in your hometown and where you come from and sharing that with others that don't come from the same uh, background. I grew up on a farm. I understand what it took. And when I left the farm, my dad sold grain, our corn for a buck thirty a bushel. and. Someone in, in, we were just with some representatives in, in New Mexico the other day when we were in D.C. They don't understand really where that relates. So you have to bring it down to where they can understand it. Showing the product, talking about the benefits, talking about job, jobs and what it does for the economic sector. But what those politicians really care about are their own consumers and voters. So what do they really care about and what's the tie? So it's mainly having an understanding of you know, everybody's a different consumer today. We all like different items. I, I, I think differently than my wife and my kids, but they all, we have to reach each different individual on their level. So to kind of understand where they're coming from. So we've changed our platforms a, as, a, as a lobbying group as well. We've, we kind of tried to simplify it to what really matters. And, and in our industry, uh, the three points that we're making are environment, Good for environment, good for your vehicle, and good for the economy. So when you simplify, it seems to like, it, it makes it easier for folks to, to consume. So those are items we've been doing, but everybody has their own story, and your story matters, I, I, I believe, and, and how it can broadly get out there more than it could in the past, and social media has changed what, what that has been. Yeah, I would just add to what Kelly said, and that is, Every senator, every congressman has their own special interest. And since ethanol is such a, has such a wide variety of benefits, we can, we can touch on just about any senator's or congressman's, congressman's interest, whether that's agriculture, national security, price at the pump, supply of oil in North Carolina. We can hit so wide of a variety of topics that we always have something to interest our politicians in Washington, D.C. And at the end of the day, if they're a Dale Jr. fan, you just say he's running it in his car. Yeah. So you got that too, right? Yeah. Exactly. I, I mean, that's one of the ways they got to me. I'm a you know, diehard NASCAR fan. So we ha we've had a question come in on Instagram. Um, and so, uh, Doug or Kelly, I'll let either of you answer this. What are other uses of ethanol? You know, we've talked a lot about fuel consumption. Are there other uses for this? And we've talked about the different uh, products, byproducts of the process. Are there any others? Well, 
uh, the vast majority of the ethanol we produce is used for fuel. Now, ethanol is alcohol, okay? There have been ethanol plants that produce vodka, for example. Um, but we are 200 proof alcohol. And so, you know, we can be used for solvents and we can be used for cleaning. We can be used for anything and alcohol can be used for. But we produce our ethanol specifically for the fuel market. Um, we like to say, drink the best, burn the rest. <laughs> That's a nice little tagline there. We'll see if somebody uh, <laughs> wants to tweet that on social media. <laughs> hashtag Biofuels 101, hashtag tag 16. Other questions from our audience? Yes, right here. That was a great question. We were just asked, how is the price of ethanol determined? Because as a consumer at the pump, we're not buying straight ethanol, it's a mixture. So who's controlling that price and how is that set? I wish I could say it's a free market supply demand issue, but it's really not. Um, we are, to a certain degree, we are priced at a price point that is um, desirable by the oil companies, okay? We are 10% of fuel supply today. We can produce more than that. That's why we're introducing E15, E85, E30, and all these higher blends so that we can grow. But we have been somewhat at the mercy of the oil companies who typically define what our price is. Um, if it was a free market, like I said before, we wouldn't be 10% of the fuel supply. We'd be 30 or 40% of the fuel supply. Uh, and that's something that we are fighting for. We think that if consumers have a choice of multiple blends at a pump, we will create more of a free market and have more of a value proposition. Like I said before, we're competing with products that might be $2 a gallon more expensive than ours. That's a good example of we're not getting the value out of our product that our, va our product offers to the consumer at the pump. So I don't know if that's a great answer to your question, but um, we are trying to create a free market so that ethanol is priced more specifically on that basis rather than a controlled market by the oil companies. Other questions? Yes, right here. Yes. So the question, um, one of our participants here in our live audience was able to tour one of Poet's facilities yesterday and was quite impressed with how they have tied in with the community and utilizing resources for the community within their plant. And the question is around, do you have other locations that are similar to the one that she was able to tour yesterday? Yeah, could we bring up slide eight? Is that possible? That should be a picture of our Project Liberty. Um, and then I'll, I will explain it. Okay, so we can't see this here in, in the live audience, but through the web, I think you can see a picture of an ethanol plant. And we have put our first cellulosic ethanol plant right next to a grain-based plant. So we bring grain into the grain plant. We make ethanol and feed. That doesn't change. To the cellulosic plant, we bring in corn stover. We make as much ethanol as we can out of that. And then we have a lot of residual waste. All that waste is going to go through a solid fuel boiler and an anaerobic digester, and that will produce the methane gas and the steam to power both the grain-based facility and the cellulosic facility. So now we have a self-sustaining, multiple energy generating system that sits side by side with each other. In Chancellor, we have a very similar situation. We bring in methane gas from a local landfill, and we have a solid fuel boiler burning biomass and waste pallets, reducing our need for fossil fuel. When we have a cellulosic facility next to a grain-based facility, we eliminate our need for fossil fuels. So that's just a tremendous economic benefit, tremendous change in our energy system nationwide because we can put a cellulosic facility next to every one of those 200 grain-based facilities that Kelly talked to and completely change the energy landscape of this country. 
this opportunity there. We've had a question come in uh, from Tyler via Twitter, and his question is, how will the increase of ethanol fuels affect the price of commodities? There's a lot of different answers you could say there, but from the, the, broad, the broad answer is we think it gives a lift to grain commodities because it provides another use, another source of that. And uh, the other side of it is what happens as this industry grows is, is one of the items that people think isn't a benefit, but it is a benefit. We create more protein and more food for the globe once there's more biofuels because you're taking, you're just taking, you're adding, you're building new markets, you're building new products. You're not taking away from the supply, you're actually adding to it. This is, this is crop that wouldn't even been planted. And we're not taking more land. That's one of the things we get hit with. We're taking, there's less land uh, used to, to provide to this industry and the whole, the whole corn market than there was in the 1940s based on yields. So we'd have to find the solutions together uh, to, to work together to, to create more markets. Yeah, and let me add to that. I think there's another slide that we should put up. It's uh, slide number three, if you can. That should be a slide that shows um, the price of grain since about, what, 1925, alongside the price of oil, same time frame, okay? And when you look at the price of grain, we've gone from, I don't know, $1.20 to $3.50 today. The price of oil has gone from a dollar twenty to well over a hundred, and now it's settling in at forty-five dollars. Um, my point on this question is that grains, ethanol doesn't drive commodity prices like oil drives commodity prices. Okay, when we have problems in commodity markets, it's probably because oil markets are so high, and everything follows that. Um, you know. Until 1973, the price of a barrel of oil and the price of a bushel of corn were almost the same, okay? And then in 1973, a little trivia for you. Does anybody know what happened in 1973? There are some people that were around at that time. We had an OPEC oil embargo. That's where OPEC said, we're not going to sell oil to the United States because they're friends with Israel. The price of oil went from $3 a barrel to over $30 a barrel, a 10x increase. We had major economic and national security issues over that. Um, then in 2001, we had another global catastrophe, 9-11. Buildings came down in New York. The price of oil went from $23 a barrel to up to $150 a barrel and settled in at about 100, okay? Major economic disruption, major problem for the country. My point is if we don't get away from oil, if we don't have an alternative to oil, we're always at the whim of OPEC and the Middle East problems, okay? Ethanol can solve that issue by being the alternative, an economically viable alternative. So that's a long-winded answer to a commodity question, but I wanted to get it in so people understand it's not us that's driving food prices. There is more petroleum cost in transportation than there is grain cost in food by a long way. So that's an argument that people like to bring up. It's not true. It's just like all the other myths. Um, there's usually a, a very reasonable solution uh, to the myths that are out there. I think that's a phenomenal way to answer that question and certainly sheds even more light on the misconceptions going back to our very first question. Um, we've had two other questions come in from Twitter. I'm going to try to get both of these in and then I'm going to ask a wrap-up question of our two panelists. So the first question comes from Christine Penning via Twitter and she asks, um, what's your opinion on corn stover? Is it really going to take off in the next few years? Um, yes, I think it will. I think corn stover is going to be a great feedstock for ethanol production for several reasons. Number one, um, farmers are now looking for a way to take some stover off the land because there's so much stover, the, the land isn't warming up fast enough. So we have, our program is to offer the farmers to take 25% of the above ground weight off of the field. You need a lot of that stover to keep the nutrition of the land up. But we have found that it's sustainable to take 25% of it off. Now there's a lot of corn and a lot of biomass in the Midwest. That's a biomass that is there. 
we can add value to it, and we can convert it. And so we're committed to the cellulosic ethanol process, and that corn stover is going to be our main feedstock for quite a while. I, I know, you know, all this being from the south, there's not, we don't, I recently visited Iowa and saw all these corn stover bales, or else I would be probably a little lost in this conversation because that's not a big uh, process yet in the South, and we don't grow near as much corn as you do here in the Midwest. And so uh, seeing those bailed out there in the fields uh, certainly makes you to ride by, and, and when you see it bailed up like that, you think there's a lot of it. So it's great that, that we're finding an alternative resource and something to do with that, with that product. Our next question from Twitter is uh, from Ashton, Ashton Moore, and Ashton asks, can we ever run out of ethanol in the future? And if your answer is no, how do you know that for sure? Gotta I don't have the magic wand on this side, so <laughs> maybe Doug has some. Well, uh, let's see. So in 2012, we had a drought that was a 50 or 100 year drought. We were short grain in the United States the world was, had ample supply. And that was because uh, ethanol came along and soaked up surplus grain and people started investing in agriculture around the world. Until that time, until ethanol came, came through and soaked up surplus grain, the United States supplied the world with all its grain. Now the world is supplying itself a little bit better. We can get, we can go a lot, lot farther, but there's always going to be grain. There's always going to be a need for fuel um, if the question is, will we ever run out of ethanol, I would absolutely say no, because it's such a critical component of our fuel supply and our energy system today. Um, we'd, we'd have major, major problems if uh, there was no ethanol from energy to agriculture to the economics to everything else. So no, it's not going to run out. Ethanol is here to stay as long as there's an internal combustion engine running in the United States. And to that end, uh, <coughs> the, the markets are expanding globally as production as well. There's ethanol production in many other countries today that wasn't even available or around along with that, that grain that's being produced. So uh, there's some serious air quality issues as you, as you spin the globe around in, in certain countries. And they're finding just small, small portions of ethanol, four, five, six, seven, up to 10% in a motorcycle in India or Japan can significantly clean up the air quality issues that they have. So to the bigger, broader problem, we can answer that. And what happened when this, this industry, in a matter of about two years, went from, what, 3 billion gallons to about 10 billion <laughs> gallons. So we've been, when challenged, the farmer and the, and the ethanol industry is ready for that challenge. Yeah, I, you know, I've been to uh, India and China recently, and they have tremendous air quality issues. If, if you want to see it, just Google those, those places. You can't see two miles on a clear day because of all the smog. And those countries are moving to higher blends of ethanol, as Kelly said, because transportation is a major source of that pollution. So the trend is to get more ethanol in the fuel supply globally. Um, and some countries are starting at low percentages, but they'll get up to 10%. Um, so ethanol is not going anywhere. Uh, it's critical to too many things at this point. Is the U.S. to that point, is the U.S. kind of leading the way in this ethanol production? Are we the, the, the pioneers of this from a world standpoint? From a we are not really the pioneers. Um, we've been at this for, you know, hundreds of years making alcohol and using it as a fuel. But um, I mentioned 1973. In 1973, Brazil decided they were going to be independent of oil. And so they started producing a lot of ethanol. If you're in Brazil today, you have a choice. You can mix 27.5% ethanol in your car or 100% ethanol. Those are your two choices, okay? So they have a minimum standard of 27.5% ethanol, which goes to the questions of can you run it in your small engine and does it ruin your car? And, uh, no, it doesn't. And yes, you can run it in your small engines. Um, but they really led the way. Um, ethanol is the largest producer of ethanol in the world today, though. We've surpassed yeah, Brazil so in production. Yeah, U.S., we're, we're double their production. The uni United States is the largest by far now. But many different countries are producing ethanol. There's 60 different countries last year that utilized ethanol. Not all as a fuel, but as uh, different 
different uses for ethanol. So there's a lot of expansion globally taking place. So we're working with U.S. Grains Council on a specific effort around all this because they've been in a lot of those countries already supplying products from the ag industry. So I think we've had a phenomenal conversation this morning. Uh, certainly some eye-opening uh, stats and figures and uh, different bits of knowledge about the biofuels industry. So thank you both so much for not only hosting us here today in Sioux Falls and, and for letting all of those online tune in, but also for providing this wonderful knowledge to us all so that we're better educated to talk about the biofuels industry and its impact on agriculture. I'd like to remind everyone who's watching us online to join us later this afternoon for the Teach Ag Day festivities. Uh, we hope your school, your location, wherever you're joining us from has lots of fun activities planned. We look forward to visiting with you um, today uh, at a later time. To do, uh, And remember to use the hashtag tagged16 for the Teach Ag Day activities. And with that, thank you all very much. And we will see you this afternoon. Thank you all. Thank you.